Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa So good evening friends. It is the uh, evening of the Oposita, the full moon in the month of February. And while it, it's, it's not um, an ancient practice for many centuries, this, um, this particular full moon has been known as Maga Puja in um, Thailand and in surrounding countries. So um, ever, since, uh, ever since the Buddha's passing, there have been two major Buddhist holidays. There's been Visaka Puja, which is a commemoration of the Buddha of his birth, his enlightenment, and his parinirvana, or, or his passing away. And Asala Puja, which is the entering into the monsoon season, which is very significant for monastics. Um, it's in July. And that was said to be the time when the Buddha offered his, his first major teaching, the Dhamma Chaka Pawatana Sutta, the turning of the wheel of Dhamma, um, so that comm commemorates the Dhamma. And Manga Puja, um, again, coming quite late, it was just reasoned that why not have a holiday that celebrates the Sangha? Because many hundreds, um, thousands years later, uh, it's the Sangha that's carried the message of the Buddha and Dhamma to us um, through the generations. So this Maga Puja um, commemorates uh, a time in the Buddhist dispensation where he had, um, he had a number of enlightened disciples and he had sent them out to the four corners to let people know that there was a Buddha, a living Buddha alive in the world, uh, teaching the Dhamma, the way to enlightenment, to the deathless. Uh, this is a temporary thing. Uh, so the Buddha was doing this out of compassion. He was, he was sending them forth uh, to let people know that if they had the desire to hear the Dhamma, then they should come, they should find him. And uh, after uh, a number of years, these enlightened disciples spontaneously came back together um, all in one spot without any prior planning. And at that time, the Buddha saw the significance of it and he gave them what was called the Ovada Padimokha. It was, was before there was a set of monastic rules. And um, this uh, Ovada Padimokha was an encouragement um, to abandon unskillful habits, acquire skillful habits and purify the mind. And the Buddha said, this is the teaching of all the Buddhas. And this was in a way the first padimokha, the first um, set of discipline for monastics. But now, even though this is um, a holiday, a special day, it is also um, a quite common observance known as the uposita. And so years later, um, the Buddha had been teaching and he had been encouraging people to practice. And uh, all of the other religions had a Sabbath day. They observed um, different days of the month, different days of the year. Uh, and then they observed the lunar quarters uh, or uh, at least they observed the full moon and the new moon. And the Buddhists, the disciples of the Buddha were, were kind of like wondering, you know, what about us? You know, they saw the other religions getting together and having special days and special observances. And um, they thought that maybe they were missing out. 
and specifically they thought they were missing out because they, 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 they thought maybe the Buddha was holding back or maybe they hadn't asked. And so they, they gathered up um, uh, a group and they went and they asked the Buddha to um, institute an uposita observance so that they too would be able to take advantage of a holy day, a Sabbath day. And this was a new concept. The Buddha hadn't gone out of his way to establish this because um, as we see it in Buddhism, any day where we commit ourselves to the practice leading to um, the end of suffering, that is an auspicious day. It can happen any day of the week, any day of the month. It doesn't have to sync up with the sun or the moon or patterns of weather. It doesn't have to be a significant uh, point in our lives. Uh, not a new year or a harvest season. Um, any day, any day can be the most important day of our lives uh, if we give it to ardent effort uh, to realize what hasn't yet been realized, and to attain a peace which hasn't yet been attained. Um, but nevertheless, human beings, what they are, still the lay people are like, yeah, 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 but still it'd be really nice to have a Sabbath. <laughs> it'd be really nice to have a special day so that we can um, come together. So Amaga Puja, it said that these, these Arahants, there were 1,250 of them, uh, in, uh, as it was said, would, came together spontaneously for the Ovada Padimoka. But um, lay people can't really, they're, they're busy. They can't be counted on um, relying on their psychic intuition and when to come together and when to hear good teachings on the Dhamma and to practice. And so the Buddha, out of compassion, he set forth and observance on the Oposita day, and that is on the full moon and the new moon, um, so that every two weeks people could gather and they could, um, they could take up special practices, special observances. So there was nothing existing. And one can, can wonder what, um, what would an enlightened being think was most auspicious? And the Buddha, instead of saying you should um, uh, fast or you should um, uh, sacrifice this many animals or you should go for a ritual bath, all of these were practices in India at the time. Uh, the Buddha said on this supposed today, your observance can be to practice in the way of the enlightened beings. So for at least one day, of the fortnight, live like an arahant lives. And he said, this would be tremendous, uh, of tremendous benefit for you. And um, it's not that by acting like an enlightened being, we are becoming enlightened for a day. But nevertheless, the, the way that the enlightened beings live is a way devoid of greed, hatred, and delusion. It's a peaceful way of living, but it's also surprisingly accessible, this peace. So what the Buddha was suggesting was give it a try. See, you might just develop a taste for it. And these things that the Arahants do, um, they're not that profound. They abandon unwholesome activities. And otherwise they live a calm, relaxed and peaceful life with few distractions and few needs, brimming with contentment, mindful and comprehending their situation in the world. So this is, um, this is the oposita observance and the precepts that we've taken together are merely to codify that way of life. The five precepts as they're taught are the taking on of skillful practices um, which prevent decline. Now, if we can just keep from killing, stealing, cheating on a partners, lying, and taking intoxicants leading to heedfulness, heedlessness, 
which causes the breaking of the other precepts. If we can just avo avoid those five things, then there's no significant route by which we would end up in a worse state at the end of this life. And in fact, by abandoning those five things, the probability is tipped in the favor that we will be in better shape at the end of this life. The three extra precepts that are taken by many on the Aposita are what are called the uh, renunciate precepts. And just hearing those, um, one can say, oh, wow, this is, uh, this, is, this is a step up. This is much more vigorous. But enlightened, an enlightened being would say, oh, that's good stuff. Those, those are very good ideas. Because what we abandon with the renunciate precepts are those things which um, compound distraction and chores and um, wasted time. So we abandon uh, indulgence in food. We abandon indulgence in outgoing activities and entertainments. We abandon um, indulgence in sleep. And this, these renunciate precepts really um, symbolize um, the way of the oposita observance that has been the tradition um, I was raised in as a monastic. I ordained at a Thai forest monastery in California and in Northern Thailand, Northeastern Thailand specifically, every week, so they even add in the half moons, every week the people of the village will go to um, the temple and will take the eight precepts and they'll spend the whole day at the temple They'll offer food to the monks and they'll eat a big meal and they'll do some chores, help take care of the monastery. They'll lounge around, they'll siesta in the afternoon and then in the evening, they'll um, gather for puja, for dhamma talks, often multiple dhamma talks. And they'll sit up the whole night spending that time at the temple. It's really an amazing uh, way of life and uh, for those of us in the West who haven't grown, grown up around uh, that level of practice and devotion, it, it may seem incredible and bizarre that people would do this knowing that the next morning they're going to gather their things and they're going to return home. And many of them will go straight off to work. It's like, how, do they, how could they do it? How could they survive? And yet this is built on an incredible appreciation of what it means to be a human being and specifically what it means to be a human being in a time when the Dhamma is known and when the Dhamma is accessible and when it's possible to practice with other beings who know and appreciate the Dhamma. Uh, so what's become ritualized in that society is actually a very powerful understanding that time is short and this opportunity is precious. And even if you're just to give one day a week to this practice, uh, living like an arahant, it would be of immense, almost immeasurable benefit to you uh, going into the future. And so when I first showed up at the monastery, I naturally, uh, um, I struggled with, with this idea of, of sitting up all night, listening to Dhamma talks and sitting and walking and um, not laying down, not um, turning on a TV, not eating uh, a big meal, uh, but just being just being a person. I got to um, see uh, in very clear definition um, the state of my mind as it actually was. And this is uh, not, not that hard to do actually um, to get to really see where we are in our practice. Um, but the reason most people never make an honest assessment is they never do just this. They never 
um, set aside uh, a, a portion of time and just uh, enough time that all of the, for lack of a better word, the bullshit in their mind can't sustain itself. If one were to sit up an entire night, they might, they might start out very, uh, very vigorous, wanting to practice in a very dedicated style. But as the hours um, continue and roll on and tick away, um, there's no way they could sustain that sort of vigor all night long. Naturally, the body is going to tire, the mind is going to tire. And I think this is built into the scenario. Like there's nobody saying that you should um, be able to take the eight precepts and instantly be able to have blissful states of mind and unwavering energy. Um, there's, there's really no reason to expect that, to be honest. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't how we're wired. It isn't the way the mind works. Um, we start out and we, we enter into the practice having never practiced, or at least not in this lifetime. And we're introduced to these ideas and we need to um, sort of scrub off our old patterns. And so I, though I started to, to struggle and resist and try really hard to keep up the level of intensity that I, I would uh, usually do sitting um, for an hour in the morning or an hour in the evening and try to sustain that through the night, I eventually learned that that's, that just, it just wasn't possible. That instead I had to approach the whole evening with the idea of pacing myself. And that once I did that, um, you know, things started to shift. I started to see just a glimmer at first, um, but I, I could kind of see that this is really what the Oposita is about. It's not about stepping up our practice, but it's about balancing our pace, balancing our mind, balancing our life. Because these eight precepts are a reflection of the way that Arahants, the enlightened beings, live every day. They don't set a single day of the week or month or year to practice in this balanced way. They have um, they have brought the balance into themselves. They have abandoned all of those activities which are off balance. And when you abandon all of the things that are distractions, uh, the things that knock us off balance, then all that's left is a mind that is intrinsically bright and intrinsically uh, pure and radiant. The reality is there's no such thing as energy, um, not the way we tend to think of it uh, when we're holding back, when we're trying to um, give just, an, just enough, uh, when we're trying to, to thread the needle, so to speak, of applying ourselves, but not overdo it. Uh, we enter in with all sorts of ideas about exerting ourselves or um, not being able to exert ourselves, of being exhausted. Uh, finding the balance is more about um, relaxing into our state of being, our natural state of being, and realizing when we are interested and when we are not distracted, energy is a natural consequence. It is when we point our minds in the direction of an object that we're interested in. Um, the, the thought, I'm too tired, or um, I, don't have a, I don't have much time, I've got to really get the most out of this experience. These ideas don't enter in. The way of an enlightened being is to uh, give their, their full attention to what's going on right now, but in such a way that 
they know it's impermanent. Um, this, this moment is precious because it is fleeting. And so they're aware, but they also are uninvested. They, um, they are interested in what's happening around them. They um, are not um, distracted by entertainments. They don't put value judgments on things. The thing in front of them is the most interesting thing. And with that sense of interest comes a sense of natural energy and participation in the moment. What I found um, by uh, repeatedly going through this process, this uposita observance, um, week after week after week for years was um, all of the resistance started to fall away. All of the ideas that I, even that I needed to pace myself, um, like I would, you know, there was a phase where I'd, I'd grab these cups of coffee, the super espresso, and I'd say, okay, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get through this evening with a ton of energy. And I would just drink a whole pot of coffee. And I'd say, now there's no way I'm gonna fall asleep. I'll meditate, I'll vipassana all night long. And those were the nights I crashed the most quickly. <laughs> Conversely, those nights when I entered into it without expectations. And I said, okay, I'm gonna be here for six or seven hours. And I'll just settle in. I'll try and get a, a position that's comfortable. And I would just listen to the cicadas. I would just, um, have one ear open for people coming and going from the Dhamma hall. Those were the evenings where um, I found a sort of peace and brightness. And what really started to happen was um, all of the BS was flowing out of my mind. And I realized that when I was sitting down for a long session, such as during the oposita, that really had to be my main goal. And that was really my main obstruction to having a good evening, to having a auspicious day of practice was um, all of the things I was telling myself about what this experience should be. When I stopped that, I was just here for the experience I was having. And that was a much happier state of being. I found myself um, through developing uh, the lifestyle of these eight precepts, even starting to question how many times I was shifting during the night. And this is something that meditation teachers will often uh, encourage or even um, uh, drum into their students early on is that one shouldn't shift, shouldn't move, shouldn't change posture. Well, I, ne I never really came from that school. I was all over the place. <laughs> I, would, I would shift and I would itch and I would um, change my posture and switch from one style to the other. I'd have in incredible leg pains. And um, so I had spent much of the evening trying to, trying to make myself comfortable, trying to um, find that position uh, where I wouldn't hurt. Gradually over time, I started to wonder what it would be like if I just let go of that effort to make it not hurt. What if I let go of that effort to make the experience enjoyable? Uh, what if I even relaxed my um, resistance to um, the unpleasant parts, you know, the, the tiredness, the, the muddledness of mind, um, the questions of what am I doing? Uh, am I getting anything out of this? Is this gonna be a good evening or is this a waste of time? Why am I sitting up all night when I'm just gonna be tired the next day? What if I just 
tolerated all of that. And now I was starting to see uh, what the Buddha calls the most powerful of all austere practices, namely patience. What if I approached the entire evening with a sense of patience and tolerance and acceptance yeah, that it was going to be what it was going to be. And so I would sit down at eight o'clock for the, for the Dhamma talk for the evening puja. And um, I would just say, what would happen if I just continued sitting here until midnight? And now at the monastery at midnight, there was a sort of uh, tea time session where they would turn on the lights and you know tea would be passed around and people would be able to, to talk Dhamma for about an hour, you know, kind of recharge the energy banks. Um, so it was a natural stretch. What if I just decide for these, you know, three, four, five hours to just stay where I am, to just keep sitting here, to not go anywhere, to not get up and, and walk around or stretch my legs but to just see what will come. And in that letting go of my expectations, I think I finally found the balance of mind that I had been struggling for so many years to try to find through controlling variables. Because the, bo the body and the mind can only experience so much pain and discomfort. <laughs> we resist it so much, any discomfort, any pain, we don't, we don't want it. It's not supposed to be here. It's not supposed to be this way. Um, but that's actually what takes the most effort because it's not in accord with reality. There is discomfort. There is inconvenience. There are long nights with waves of energy and then tiredness coming and going, washing over us. That is a reality. That's what it means to be a flesh and blood human being. And what happens when we allow reality to come in, um, to finally come in and to drop all of the processes of mind that are meant to try to control our experience of reality. Well, what happens is, is very curious. I like to think of it in terms of um, like uh, going camping. You know, I'll say that uh, if you go camping and everything is perfect, it's a perfect site, it's perfect weather, you know, perfect food, there are no bugs, uh, and you, you have a wonderful walk in the woods, and then you go home. Will you have any stories at all? Would anybody listen for more than 30 seconds of you just saying how perfect your trip was? Isn't it true that the real variety and spice of life is when something goes wrong? Can you think of it? every time you've had a wonderful story, wasn't it around the challenges and the overcoming of challenges that really um, is most compelling? It's those camping trips where um, there's a thunderstorm or where the, the bugs <laughs> chase us from site to site. It's those camping trips where our canoe flips over and we have to make do without a cooler full of food. It's those camping trips that we, we really get challenged and we really have something to talk about afterwards. There's something to be said for unpleasantness and that when we let it in, at first it's like, it's like beginning splashed with cold water. It causes us to tense up. But after a moment or two, and um, you know, there are people who I, I've heard about this, who, who go into bodies of cold water in the winter um, to sort of invigorate themselves. <laughs> uh, there's, after a minute or two, there's an equilibrium. You know, you realize, yes, 
it is cold, but that's all it is. It's just cold, nothing else. What happens is that the mental resistance falls away and there is just a physical experience. And when one finds that equilibrium within themselves, one has found the balance and the peace and the energy and the joy that is the ongoing experience of an enlightened being. And nobody can uh, create this experience for us. Nobody can give us of their own experience of this. It's not possible. The Dhamma is to be experienced by each wise person for themselves. And so this is something that we have to find within ourselves. Our teachers, our, the Buddha, and the universal principles which he woke up to, these are merely our guides and our maps to this peace. These are merely suggestions about how to arrive at it. And it's until we commit ourselves to a practice, and it's not, not until then that we find, um, we find the challenge, the endeavor, the energy within ourselves um, to come to know this equilibrium, to come to know this peace where uh, pleasant and unpleasant finally strikes a balance. And that is the experience of being a human being. Often what we'll find is an experience um, not unlike one that we might have uh, suddenly finding ourselves awake in the middle of the night when it's totally quiet and we're lying in bed staring at the ceiling. Maybe, maybe we've all been there at some point. And there's nothing. There's no TV, no phone, no other people. There's nothing but us and the voice in our mind and a dark room. And we begin to wonder what it's all about. We begin to wonder, where are we and where are we going? When we take on these practices, when we observe the oppositta, uh, when we give ourselves to just being, even for just a single day, we're kind of letting that inquiry in we're not waiting until it sneaks up to us late at night or during some midlife crisis, but we're, we're letting it in. We're, in fact, we're setting a space for it. We're creating a comfortable little seat for it to come and sit down and hang out with us for a while because that's also part of our reality is that uh, a lucky human being will live 80 or 100 or even a little bit more years on this planet, and then everything they've accomplished will um, fade away, will be lost, they will pass on, and they will have only the results of their actions and their endeavors to, um, to carry them onward. Uh, that is our reality. And so when we, we sit, um, it's not as though we're trying to accomplish anything. Instead, we are trying to strike a balance with this reality that's always there. We're trying to find this balance where this understanding that everything we're doing in life is balanced by the fact that we're going to eventually lose it all. And when these two things are not in conflict, but they're able to uh, coexist in our mind, well, then we've attained to the mind of the enlightened beings, those that know there is suffering. There is suffering has a cause. It's all that stuff we were doing before we got here. 
all of the confusion and delusion and greed and hatred, but there is an end to suffering. And that's also right here. And that the way to this end of suffering is these practices we take on, which are symbols guiding us to a balanced life. And a balanced life is not about things that we get. You can't point to two arahants and say, um, really anything that they, you both concretely do, that this, this, these are the things that they do and this is what makes them an arahant. You can only point to the things that they don't do. Um, so they, they live lives, they eat food, they wake in the morning, go to sleep in the evening. They just do it with a sense of natural pacing, natural grace, uh, and natural um, equilibrium in their hearts. Life balanced with death in every moment. And so um, if they stay up all night, they don't go anywhere. They're just here in this body on this planet. And if they go to sleep at night, they don't do it with fear because there's, there's, no, um, there's no bad state waiting for them if they pass on without doing any more practice. They've already found what it is that people undertake the spiritual pursuit to find. And so that is what we have the opportunity to cultivate tonight um, to whatever degree we can. And it's, it's nice to um, reflect that uh, this is an opportunity. It's not uh, an imposition. There's nobody that says we have to do this. It is an optional practice. Uh, it is for those who want to find a peace that they can access at any time. And so it's, it's really something um, quite special and profound. But while in the beginning, it might seem like it is arousing energy, it is the more vigorous of practices for those who are most hardcore, you will find if you stick with it, that it becomes a practice of serenity and acceptance. It becomes um, the practice of those who understand the long game, who understand what it means to devote themselves to something completely and unwaveringly, uh, knowing that uh, they will be the, the owners of their karma. And so they're along for the ride willingly and openly, openly and um, enthusiastically, uh, not holding anything back, but giving themselves, um, giving themselves completely. So using uh, a taking of precepts or a night's meditation, or even just stepping out of the day's activities to listen to a Dhamma talk, using that as their, um, their relinquishing of their sense of control to the greater reality of um, things are okay. Things can be in balance when we let go of all of those things that knock us off of balance. So these are the thoughts I would like to offer this evening. And they are a prelude to an opportunity to um, sit together. So I'll be sitting here. And um, this is uh, one of the, the few things that I can offer having uh, practiced in this way for so many years is to know that even if I fall asleep and drool on the chair, at least I tried. And sometimes that is the one thing that uh, is, is lacking in the world. Uh, it's just people trying. And when people are trying, then you know there is, there is Sangha, you know, there is going to be support along the journey. Uh, and that is um, 
So it's with, with joy that I share this reflection tonight and the practice with all those who will be um, joining in and in the future. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.